Good morning, Kingdom Arise Church. My name is Caesar. Uh, we are, I am a part of the ministry team here at Kingdom Arise Church. Uh, I have the privilege and honor to speak to you this morning. Uh, as always, we're so glad that you joined us on this Sunday. We're so glad that you could be here and that you're spending time with us as we worship and follow the Lord. Let us bow our hearts and our minds in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are doing in and through our lives. Lord, we ask, Father God, this morning that you would speak, that your spirit would descend like a flood, that your spirit would be released onto your people, Lord, that you would give us greater understanding, that you would give us a more uh, uh, intuitive heart inclined towards you, Father, that we would release our old ways, that we would continue to seek you further and deeper, Father. These are perilous times that we are living in, Lord, and only you know the outcome. So let us draw near unto you, Father. Let us cling to you. Let us follow you. Let us follow the steps that you have already set before us, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for this morning. Lord, I pray for every believer that is out there that is listening to this message this morning, that you would impact them, that you would touch them, that you would confirm, that you would reveal, that you would, that you would just do what you do in them, Father. Do what you must, Father. Remove, Father God, our stubbornness. Remove the, the pains and the anguish of this week, Lord. Remove the worries. We cast that all aside. For yours is the honor, the glory, and the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, this week, we're picking back up in Luke 15, verse 8. We're talking about the parable of the lost coin. And I know our pastor last week, uh, Pastor Ray Prado, was talking about the parable of the lost sheep, that Christ said that he would not lose one. And he's speaking to the Pharisees here. Let us retract a little bit just to get a foreground on where we're at. Verse 15, 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he spoke this parable to them. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Jesus says that he did not come for the righteous, that he came for sinners. He came for you and I. He came not for a religion, but he came to set the captives free. So we read on. The Pharisees and the scribes are complaining to Jesus saying, why do you eat with these people? They're trying to push their religion, their rules, the, 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 the rules that society has made that the righteous have to be. Why do you eat with such filth, they say? Jesus says that a hospital is needed for sick people. And he is that hospital. He is the healer. He is the one to bring us home. So let's read on. Verse 8, this is entitled, The Parable of the Lost Coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So as Jesus was listening to the Pharisees and the scribes complain on how he received and ate with sinners, we read in verse 8 that about this woman that loses something valuable. She loses one coin out of her ten. And she's flipping the house. She's going through the house. It says that she stops she lights a lamp. She sweeps the house and searches carefully. 
she flips the whole house inside out. She moves the furniture. She moves the tables. She moves the, the, the chairs. She moves the sofa. She moves the TV. She moves everything out the way to find this lost coin. She knows its value. Jesus says in John 6, 39, that he has not lost one that God has given him. We are that lost coin. We are those sinners. We are those ones that God is calling after. God will move mountains and drain oceans, will uncover the earth to find you. You are that valuable to God. You mean that much to him that he will go to the ends of the earth. You mean that much to him. He knows your worth. And he will never give up on you. He will never stop telling you how much he loves you. God is constantly chasing after our hearts. God is constantly reminding us of how much he loves us, of what he did for us. Verse 9, we read on. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Heaven is overjoyed that it has found one, that it has found one sinner, that it has found one lost sheep, that it has found one that has been called home, that has been called into a family into, to inherit eternity with God. Let me ask you this. How do you know when something is yours? How do you know when something belongs to you? What can you tell? What, what, what gives it that distinction that it's yours? You recognize the uniqueness of it, right? We all go, we, we all buy the same shoes, we all buy the same articles of clothing, but yet we distinctly recognize what is ours, what belongs to us. There's a, there's a characteristic to it that can identify it as yours, as ours. You know the wear and tear and all of the imperfections that that thing has. Guess what? So does God. God knows all of your imperfections. God knows the hurts, the anguish. He knows the pain that you've been through. He knows the heartache and the heartbreak that you have endured. He knows that you have been lost for a long time. But you have been marked you have been marked. You have been made in his image. In Genesis, it says that we are made in his image and in his likeness. We have the thumbprint. We have the fingerprint of God imprinted right on us. That when he looks at the world and he looks at all creation, he can identify, he can distinguish who is his. That's the beauty of it. You and I, are created to bear his image. You and I are made in his image. He knows your heart. He knows your flaws. And he wants to bring you home as you are. That is why all of heaven rejoices. When we accept, when we repent, and we turn back to him. And we say, Lord, I just want to get right with you. I want to be right with you. Let me come home to you. All of heaven rejoices. The angels rejoice. Heaven is overjoyed. Let's read on. 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He sees the value in you and I. The value that we carry that is worth more than gold, that is worth more than precious stones, that is worth more than, than the, the fragrant spices, frankincense and myrrh. We are worth more to him than all those sacrifices. See, the thing is, he knew these things. God foreknew the things that we would go through. He foreknew that we would fall away. He knew the evils of this world 
would try to consume us. He knew that they would try to overtake us. And in his infinite wisdom and grace, he said, I will be with you. I will carry you through the storms. I will encourage you in those times where you feel discouraged. I will embrace you when you feel lost and lonely. I will chase you to the ends of the earth. Knowing this, he said, I love them so much that I would rather do life with them than live without them. God knew. God knew what this world would bring. But he said it's worth the cost. It's worth the cost for you and I to be with him, knowing the struggles that his son must endure. Let me ask you this. Can a body function with missing parts? Christ is coming back for his bride. And each one of us matter. Each one of us are important to God. The bride is made up of important people in unity to create his perfect church. Revelation, he said he's coming back for his perfect bride without spot or blemish or wrinkle. How can that be so if we think we're so imperfect? If we think we're not worthy? If we think that our, our sin is too much to bear? What we're telling Christ, what we're telling God is that his sacrifice was not enough. That his death was, couldn't be atonement for our junk. That it was not worth it. It was not enough blood or it just wasn't enough. But who's doing the qualifying? We are. We fail to release that unto God. We fail to see the sacrifices that he made. You and I were created for a reason. And he needs us. He wants us. He desires to be intimate with us. He desires to have fellowship with us, to have communion with us. He loves us that much. You and I were created for a reason. We have been called to glorify, to exalt, to praise him but also to release his power, his authority, and his mandates here on earth. I don't know if you've thought that God has given up on you, that maybe he just stopped looking for you, that maybe you just got lost in the shuffle and you're on God's to-do list. Eventually he'll get to you. Maybe you think that way of God today. Maybe you think that you're just a number to God. Maybe you think that you're just in a queue waiting for God to get to you and there's this huge waiting room full of millions and millions of people that are just in queue. Truth is, he's not. He always has his eyes set on you. His eyes have never lost focus. They've never shifted. They've never looked away. Your entire life, his eyes have been fixated with love and awe of you and I. He is proud to call us his children. He is proud. Think about this. He is still waiting for you and I with open arms exactly at the point that we left him, exactly at the point that we said we would turn away, exactly at the point that we chased after our own lusts, our own desires, our own dreams, our own aspirations, exactly at that point that we said, Lord, the, the amount of money we can make, the amount of relationships we can have, the amount of houses, the amount of cars that I can, I can do, that I can chase, that I can acquire, mean more than you. And at that intersection, at that fork in the road, God is still standing there waiting for you to realize 
that those things will perish, that those things will fade, that those things are not eternal, but His love is. And His grace is more than enough. And He will show you a way back. He will show you a way back into His kingdom, into His heart. He will show you the importance and the value of things. For He created all things, and all things are held by Him. And without Him, nothing was created. Think about that. He loved you enough to send His only Son to die in our place. To make atonement, to make peace, so that we could have a way home. Think about how fortunate we are that we have been born, that we are living in this day and age where we are seeing the second glory, the better covenant, as Paul puts it. The better covenant of grace, that we no longer follow the law, that we are no longer inclined to the law, but we live under His grace. That you and I are priests and kings, and we can enter the throne room of grace at any point in time. The doors are wide open. You have the master key. Imagine how Moses and Aaron felt when they can only enter once a year. Imagine how Aaron felt when his sons were consumed by fire for burning the wrong fire. You and I have access and yet we, we toil it, we spoil it, we throw it away, we count it as not. You don't have to. You don't have to continue throwing that opportunity away. His word says that each day his mercies are made new. So today, my brothers and sisters, today we have the opportunity to come into grace. And if we trip and we mess up, we repent and we get back up and we try again tomorrow. There was a pastor once that said, if you are the same today as you were yesterday, then you're backsliding. I had to think about that for a long time. Think about what, exactly what that meant. If I am the same today as I was yesterday, I'm backsliding. That means there's no growth in me. There is no yearning in me to seek more of Him. I have allowed that relationship to keep stagnant. Animals even know that a stagnant river, a river that does not move, a, a pond, a stream that does not move, is bad water. They only drink from flowing streams. So we have to allow God to continue to flow through us and in us, that we may be renewed each and every single day. God knows our hearts, and He wants to continue to lead us, but not only us, for you and I. Once we get this image, once we get this image, it's more than, uh, more than about us. See, God deals with you and I, but then he starts going after the other ones that are lost. That's why all of heaven rejoices, because he went back for that one. He went back for that one, that one that you and I once were. We all were once a part of this world at one point or another. Some at a very young age, some at a much older age. And it's not that God has not been calling you your entire life. It's that our eyes were never open to see Him until someone prayed for you and I until someone appealed to the Lord for us. Someone said, Lord, I will march. I will help spread the gospel. I will help find those lost sheep. So this morning, let me ask you, do you have marching orders? 
you and I know the Great Commission. We are to spread and share the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ saves. <laughs> the beautiful part is that once he saves, he never takes it back. You and I cannot lose our salvation. Nothing that you and I could do could ever lose it. It is a gift. It is a gift from heaven. And it's such a beautiful, priceless gift. So I encourage you this morning to continue to come back to him. Do not take that gift for granted. Do not take that gift for granted. All of heaven is waiting for you to come home, to rejoice in the Lord's lost sheep. He's not going to lose one of us, not a single one. And he's waiting on you and I to come home. How many of you could sacrifice, could send your only son to die for someone you didn't know? How many of you could honestly say that, could stand here and say, I would give my son for a complete stranger, for a murderer, for an adulterer, for a sinner, for an alcoholic, for a drug addict. Truth is, none of us could. None of us could do that. But that's exactly what God did. That's exactly what God did. He said, I'm going to take my perfect son who knows no sin, who knew no sin, my perfect lamb, and I'm going to send him to the slaughter. I'm going to send him to the slaughter for all of these imperfect people, for all of these sinners that I may call them sons, for all of these sinners that I may call them home. That is the God honest truth. He's waiting. He is waiting. He is waiting with open arms. We are his masterpiece. He knew what he was doing when he created you and I. He knew it. There was never any doubt. See, we think that, that God had doubts or there was imperfections in God's plan for us. There wasn't. Each day is mapped out. Each day brings its own challenges and struggles, absolutely. But each day we are reminded that we have a Father who looks after us, who sees us, and is just waiting for us with open arms. So I don't know if this is you maybe today, brother or sister. I don't know if this is you that has been the wayward son. you are all prodigals. He's calling his prodigals home. I know the next verse in, in verse 11, we go into the parable of the lost son and I could spend hours just going down the couple scriptures there, but I really don't want to move past this point because I want to get this message across. I believe God has something very big on his heart today. He's calling his lost home. He has forgiveness in his eyes. He has love in his eyes and his arms are full of grace and mercy. Thank God that we don't get repaid, that we don't, we don't have to pay what we've done. That's what mercy is. Mercy is receiving what we don't deserve. And in our human understanding, we don't get it. Someone cuts us off on the freeway, we're mad for the rest of the morning. Maybe you got into an argument with your spouse, and that leads into the night, and now you guys are sleeping in separate bedrooms. Why can't we learn to forgive like God has forgiven us? 
You know, many times I, I discipline my son and God checks me. God says, am I harsh with you? Do I repay you for everything you've done? And I have to repent. I have to repent. I have to ask my son for forgiveness. Because he's absolutely right. You and I, we don't deserve his grace or his mercy, but he gives it freely. The Lord says that as we forgive others, he forgives us. So are you holding on to something? Are you holding on to someone that you, that you have not forgiven? Are you holding on to things that are just weighing you down and you wonder why you can't wake up in the morning and praise the Lord? Why you can't wake up in the morning and worship him freely? You are held down by this weight. You are held down by these chains. But the thing is, you have the key. In one hand, you have a shackle. And in the other hand, you have the key. But you're so blinded by the weight. You're so blinded by the anger, by the grief, that you can't seem to put one and one together. If we would stop with our busy schedules, with our emotions, and we would just allow God to speak to us, that we would allow God to just really speak to our hearts, that we would remove the stubbornness from our hearts, that we would be, remove the callousness from our hearts, and that we would truly see Him and hear Him, you would find a way out. This morning, I believe God wants you to reflect. Reflect on the conversations that you've had. Reflect on, on the actions that you've taken. And if you've wronged, ask for forgiveness. And if you've been wrong, forgive. That is perfect love. That is agape love. It's unconditional the unconditional love of God. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's the beauty of His grace. When one sinner gets it, that's why all of heaven rejoices. Because somebody actually gets it. And I pray that you and I this morning would just get it, that this is something, that this is a key, a nugget, that we would keep in our hearts, that we would lock it up, that we would treasure it, that we would value it. And also that through it, we would help set others free. The world needs love and not just any love, but a love that never fails, that never ends that has no prerequisites and needs the love of God. And you and I can be those examples to all of those people this morning. As you go about your day to day, think about your conversations. Think before you react. Be quick to listen and slow to speak, his word says. We have two ears and one mouth. We are to listen before we speak. Don't simply react on emotion. Don't simply react on emotion. You are his masterpiece. You are full of his grace and you are made in his image and his likeness. You have all the authority of heaven in the name of Jesus. You have all the authority. You have been released from bondages. You have been healed of all disease and sicknesses. Then why do we walk like we're broke? Why do we walk like we're ill? Rise up. Get up, my brother. Get up, my sister. It's time that we pick up our cross and that we follow the Lord. 
it's time. This morning, the Lord, as I was writing down this message last night, as I was going over it, the Lord really put on my heart to do an altar call this morning. I know I cannot see you, but it doesn't matter because God sees you. God sees you in your living room or in your car or on your break at work or wherever you may, may watch us this morning. He's seeing you exactly where you are and he knows the condition of your heart. And he is the good shepherd. He's waiting to be the repairman for you and I. So if this is you, this morning, if this is you that says, I need to get right with God, if this is you that says, God, would you come, would you allow me to come back into your throne of grace? I've been away for too long. I've done so many wrongs. I don't know if you can forgive me. If this is your way of thinking, I want you to stand up. I want you to find a place to, to pray right now and allow God to move. Allow the Holy Spirit to flood your space. Allow him to invade your heart. Allow his love to just overflow. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you because you do not lose one. Every single one you've called by name. You've given a unique fingerprint. You've given a unique identity that can only be found in Christ for we bear his image. And Lord, I lift up all my brothers and sisters, Father God, who have backslidden, who have taken a back seat, who have stepped away from you, who have turned away from you. Lord, as we repent this morning and we turn back to your love, we do a 180. We know that your forgiveness is given freely. So this morning we ask for your forgiveness. We repent, my God, of what we've done in our past. Father God, what we've done maybe last night or the week before, we repent of those we have offended. We repent of those we have hurt. We repent if we have hurt you, my God. We thank you that we have been allowed, that we have been given freedom to come into your throne and seek your face, Lord. We don't just seek your hand, Father, and we're not looking for a handout. We're seeking intimacy with you, Lord. We're seeking your face, my God. We want to get right with you today. So Lord, let this day mark a new beginning, a new chapter, a new page that we're going to turn that has nothing written on it. From this day forward, our past has been forgiven. And we step into this new covenant with you, my God. That you would use us according to your will, that you would, that you would continue to use us to speak to us, to soften our hearts. That you would start to remove old habits and mindsets in the name of Jesus. That we would reignite a fire before you, Lord. A fire to communicate, to seek, to worship, to praise in your holy name. Lord, I thank you that we've been given this opportunity. We do not take this lightly. We do not take this lightly. From this day forward, we will live for you. We would honor you in everything that we do. And if we trip and we stumble, give us the strength to arise. Give us the strength to stand up. Give us the strength to continue to look ahead to where you are, my God. 
Allow others to see the Christ in us, that you may work on them as well. So Father, we thank you this morning for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Let it be flowing from our mouths and our hearts this morning. And let us carry this message all the days of our lives. The message of grace. And so Lord, we just thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless.